John Enright is co-founder and principal of Griffin Enright Architects. Their work has been extensively published locally, nationally, and internationally. They have received over 40 awards for design excellence, including local, state, and national AIA awards, and the American Architecture Award from the Chicago Anthenaeum. Their work has been exhibited at the Architecture and Design Museum in Los Angeles, the Syrac Gallery, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Mack Center for Art and Architecture, and as part of the permanent collection of the Mack Museum in Vienna. John is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and has been the recipient of multiple grants, including an NCARB grant for the integration of practice and education in the academy, and USC's advancing scholarship in the humanities and social sciences grant. John is currently on the Los Angeles Mayor Design Advisory Panel and the NCARB Licensure Task Force. He has been a visiting professor at Syracuse University, University of Houston, and the University of Southern California. He has taught at Syrac since 2001, where he served as undergraduate program chair since 2010, before shifting gears as the newly appointed Syrac Vice Director and Chief Academic Officer. This morning, I sat down at a cafe wondering what it would be like to interview John a couple of scenarios came to mind. Scenario A, John at his office in Syrac, sharp and accurate with his advice. I haven't missed a day of work, and I expect the same from my students, he says. Work hard, then we can discuss the work. Scenario B, John on a jury at Syrac, again, sharp and accurate with his critiques. What's that light gray line that goes across the plan? Why doesn't it turn on the second corner? I look back. John was right, they should have turned at that corner. Scenario C, John on site at Sire, the sharpness and accuracy never fades as he corrects a student's posture while he paints his model. <laughs> Scenario D, John at Griffin Enright, if possible, even sharper and more accurate. He probably questions the angles. Is 90 degrees actually 90 degrees when built? Should it tilt? Where does it start in the drawing and how is it going to end up on site? And the last scenario, scenario E, interviewing John. Notes and questions prepared, wondering if I'm sharp or accurate enough. Do the questions need to be more finesse? One thing I know for sure is John is a magician who is willing to share his tricks if you work hard so he can discuss the work. John, thank you for sitting down with me today. Thank you, Zaid. Great introduction. Thank you. Very kind. What would you consider was your first architectural project, whether academically or professionally? Um, well, it's interesting. I was just talking to a student um, uh, uh, recently, and I paraphrased uh, Andy Zago, who uh, gives a bit of advice, I think, to, to the thesis students every year uh, that I'm stealing and repeating, so I give him credit for it. Um, he says, don't think of thesis as your last student project. Think of it as your first contribution to the discipline. And uh, when I told that to the student yesterday, uh, he was immediately relieved. So on the one hand, it may be intimidating to say, oh, now I'm really contributing to the discipline. On the other hand, uh, it may be more intimidating to think of something as your last student project. So often thesis students, I think, get too intimidated and concerned, and now that you're entering thesis, maybe I can't help but turn this around, that you think about it that way. Um, and then if it's the beginning, in a way, it's like your first undergraduate project, which now you probably forget, isn't that important to you. So you can imagine your thesis being a little bit like that. Of course, we'd hope that it feeds your professional life and in the future you would say, well, my thesis was about X, Y, Z, of which I'm still interested in, in another kind of way. So it's an interesting question to say, what was one's first project? So there's a first student project or even maybe pre-student um, from high school, etc. I decided to be an architect at a very young age, at about 14. Uh, worked in an office at 15, so uh, my uncle was an architect, so I had uh, took kind of pseudo-architectural drafting and art classes in high school. So for me, it was a very early decision, which is odd. Most people don't in their life uh, have decisions like that that young. It just happened to be for me. So uh, uh, I would say, 
And, you know, in my career, of course, there's kind of two halves. There's the half uh, with Margaret Griffin and Griffin and Wright Architects, who's my wife and uh, partners in everything. Uh, and we've been 15 years doing that, even though we've known each other much longer. And of course, the 13 years plus that I had with Tom Main at Morphosis, first with Michael Rotundi and Tom Main, and then just Tom Main, uh, uh, where it was an incredible experience and, uh, and the office changed very much in that time. So I, I like to say I've been lucky to have um, amazing kind of partners. And so, uh, uh, you know, you go through life and you realize that uh, partnerships are in ways about opposites, you know, and the best partners are not, in fact, identical. They have strengths that are complementary. And uh, for whatever reason, it seems like in my life, I have been allied with what I would call strong personalities. And probably the three strongest that have influenced me would be my wife, Margaret Griffin, uh, and Tom Main, and now Hernan Diaz Alonso. And so it's really interesting that they're, they're, they're all very different people, but one commonality that they have is like conviction, uh, passion for architecture, and uh, for whatever reason, I seem to be good partners with those kind of people. So we have the school here, of course, and I'm vice director now, and I've been working with Hernan uh, kind of uh, on the other side between graduate and undergraduate as chairs, and uh, have worked really well. Uh, we have common goals, even though we're very different architects, of course. You might say, well, what do these guys have in common? Uh, but we have an absolute passion for the school and a commitment to it and understand that we have different strengths and I'm here to aid and help him and obviously he's the leader and director of the school. So uh, uh, I'm kind of rambling here but I've just kind of looped back to your original question was what was one's first project. So I suppose there, there, there would be early student projects, my first thesis in undergraduate, uh, going to Columbia right after that, meeting Tom Main and, and Michael Rotondi who are my critics and Eric Moss. Um, then a series of projects with Morphosis, which were, I think, seminal within that work, which is another discussion, or that we go back to, oh, the Use and Car Museum in the early 90s, which kind of evolved to a, a series of other projects involving landform, and eventually the Diamond Ranch High School, which Tom and I still reminisce about as, for him, being a, a very important project. We were naive, we were... Uh, this was 1993 when the competition was won. Um, it was a public project, uh, it was low budget. We were lucky, um, um, but, but to him, I think it, 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 was a, it was a big shift in the firm. And then, and then he's had many and many of those, of course, uh, across his career. So I think that would be one of the most influential projects that I was involved in. And then in our own office, of course, a whole series of projects that we've done um, and, and you talk about kind of paradigm shifts and uh, we re last year we did the Guggenheim Helsinki competition and it was really interesting because uh, our, our office, um, I should say, Margaret and I have, and it's obvious, I mean if you follow our work, we're interested in building. Um, it's very important to us. Uh, I don't, I know when I talk to faculty and, and one of the great things about SIRC is the diversity of that. So. The definition of practice is broad. Um, there are those who are purely research-based or speculative practices, whose actually ambitions may not be to manifest built form. For us, it had to be. Um, and in doing so, you shift your focus. So certain things are possible or not possible. But one has to kind of carve out or find pieces of projects which lead to other things. Uh, however, every once in a while, one has to pause and um, uh, give oneself a chance to, let's say, more towards the academy, uh, speculate on what other possible futures are. So we, we did the Guggenheim competition, not thinking we would win it. Of course, we didn't win it. Uh, but it was a very interesting project in terms of also how Margaret and I worked together and one that I think we're seeing a shift in, in our work. So um, um, that one personally is important to me because I think it's leading to other things. Right, as we go forward. And so I think in one's career you start to, I don't really look back too much, but when you look back you start, you understand it. You say, oh, okay, this represents a kind of shift in our work and it starts to go a kind of certain way. And so for me, it's not about firsts, but maybe it's multiple firsts. 
to answer your question, kind of multiple first projects, which shift one, you know, you kind of move laterally, you're kind of up, down, <laughs> etc., as you navigate uh, a profession, which is, you know, maybe we'll get to that later. What is the definition of a practice and, and, and goals, etc.? A question I was going to ask you in the end, I'll shift to the beginning, considering we're talking about academia, is your, how do you balance or how do you influence your practice with the discourse? Or do you separate yourself professionally from your academic side? Yeah. I, I don't think it's a healthy ever to separate <laughs> things, you know, that's the kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, or the uh, schizophrenic personality, which, uh, 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 however, all architects will tell you, well, there are the kind of shifts in conversation that one has to have. So uh, there are, however, bridges, and, and there need to be strong bridges within those worlds. So let's say, one is highly speculative and uh, open-ended and based on pure inquiry and intense debate. Let's say that's the academy, right? And in a sense, it has to be a protective place for all involved. Uh, because if we look at, let's say, the world or the profession, some people use the word real, but I don't like that word. So the, 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 the part of the world where um, uh, economy, uh, uh, politics, uh, uh, many things that are outside the architect's control affect what they do. And it's a very complex landscape and, and very difficult to navigate. The academy should be devoid of all those things in order to free up to think. So therefore, it has to be separated. The mistake most make are that, that bifurcation, saying there are two worlds. They're not really two worlds because the architect or the practitioner or anyone culturally involved in, in a project is mixing those things. Uh, but just like at times it's important to just look at dollars, the economy, let's say, uh, and that's useful, but you can't only do that, as is you just can't only write about architecture and say the whole, the all, everything in architecture is just in the written word and in debate. And we don't need anything else. We don't need the city. We don't need practitioners, etc. So those polar opposites, well, maybe they're not really opposites. Um, uh, architecture exists in between those things. And one has to, at times, gravitate towards one or the other in extremes in order to get anything done. Okay? So, therefore, the strongest work, of course, is based, in theory, and is based on the... Um, zeitgeist of the firm, of the individual, of their goals. Uh, but I've always felt, and this is my bias towards um, maybe building uh, as having an aim, that one has to know and be able to navigate that world. And if one stays in the, in the uh, theoretical uh, abstract side too long or shuns that other world, you actually, it may, it's very difficult to get things done. So one has to be savvy, one has to be, and this we talk about to students, right? That, um, the, and I think Tom Main talks about this a lot, uh, the multiple skills one needs to have, right? You have to be able to uh, tackle that world on its own terms for your own good. <laughs> um, and it isn't just, communicating, uh, you know, do you like this or not? Uh, uh, it, it is value-based culturally, um, and it's making alignments. But one has, the, the best architects I've found are savvy in that world. Um, and they also don't um, really shun it, nor, nor really complain about it that much. That is the world. So one engages on, the, on its own terms. And I think, I think Frank Gehry has been a master of that. I'm doing just that. I mean, uh, we tend, I think, in, and also in architecture school, to reward the artist in us, and that's the that's the kind of crown on the on the jury level. Uh, and then uh, students leave a school of architecture and realize, oh wow, there's all these other skills that are incredibly useful, right? In terms of connecting with other other people, other cultures, other kind of political constructs, etc.
I think that leads me perfectly to the next question. When you present your work, you seem to always focus on site context before the beginning of a project. Not necessarily the built context, but actually a more statistical one. Hmm. What role does context play in the way you design a project? Yeah, I think um, for Margaret and I, um, well, in, in the era we were educated, uh, which was the kind of end of the postmodern, we could say, um, certainly in our undergraduate careers, there was a lot of talk of context. Um, uh, and this was, you know, Colin Rowe, Slutsky, et cetera, that we were kind of inundated with. Uh, and the postmodern movement also, in, in some ways, dealt with context. I think that since that time, our understanding of context is much broader. And it can also be one of, let's say, cur curatorial aspects of context. One chooses what context to address. Um, um, back then, it was mm, urban scale, massing, you know, articulation, etc., which which fed the postmodern canons of um, replication, right? And so. Uh, now, uh, and, and there's, I, I think you're referring to a few of our projects that address that, maybe earlier on. I think we, don't, we talk about it a little bit less. Um, uh, but in Margaret's case, because she's also a kind of self-taught landscape architect as well, and we do, we do uh, design our own landscapes in our work, or she predominantly does, um, that is another kind of context, right? The, the scape. I prefer scape rather than landscape or earthscape. Um, uh, so, so our projects still do address that, but I would say it's an edited version. In other words, you could take, um, we could take this room and I might find a contextual relationship to something very small in it, like the screw on that door, and say, okay, that's the context. Whereas uh, someone else say, no, the context is it's white walls and it's bad acoustics. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this, this is where I think uh, we have the freedom to address uh, and we've done a series of lectures and talks on hidden agendas, meaning smaller things that are under the surface that you can bring out in architecture, which are maybe more important than the overt. Talking about scapes and roofscapes and ceilings, yep. um, looking at your firm's projects, the ceilings have an incredible amount of details and maneuvers. Could you maybe talk about the fascination of that and how it actually affects space? I, I, mean, I might answer it in, in a more broad term. Um, uh, I think in terms of detail, your question about detail, this is one I'm asked a lot. I think we're complimented many times on our work and it's attention to detail. I suppose my interest in building would uh, 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 mean that I you know, automatically, we are uh, interested in the tectonics of architecture, however we, one defines that without getting into part to whole or how they, but buildings are made of stuff and stuff is assembled and moved and placed and uh, uh, great care can be made in that or, or not. And this is uh, up to the architect and it's up to the, the project at hand. Um, uh, and I, I, there are those who care about that and there are those who don't. Um, and so when, excuse me, when you mentioned ceilings, or we could talk about stairs, or we could talk about handles, or we could talk about many different things. Um, to me, those are as much design as, as anything else is. In fact, there's going to be a show that Hernan's going to do a faculty work, and I believe it's called Close Up, uh, which is going to be about that. But it's going to be about, is there a new relationship to that? You know, I was just watching. Uh, a little video on the next generation 3D printer, which is printing multiple materials. So the engineer who was presenting it was talking about how this would completely change uh, how we understand components. So if, for instance, anything that we make, we understand has to be assembled by separate materials. In other words, uh, your phone is made by a series of plastic pieces, glass pieces, metal pieces, which when designed, have to have a sequence, right? One has to go past the other. Architecture has always been this way. And maybe if you've worked in an office or you, you say, okay, you can detail something, but you know, first the wood has to go in, then the plywood, then the waterproofing, then the this, then the that, right? 
And you have to understand that sequence because human beings are making it, right? Now, with potential, once it scales up, that sequence doesn't matter with material, meaning material could be embedded, intertwined. It's not sequential any longer. And this engineer was talking about that with product design. He wasn't talking about architecture. He was talking about product design, meaning this will change everything. This is a game changer because now things aren't layered. I mean, we could talk about this camera. It was assembled somewhere in a factory of multiple pieces. They were farmed out. They were shipped all together. The plastics came from Guangzhou. The lens came from Germany. They all came through. And then somebody put them together, one, two, three, in a completely linear way. It was linear, time-based. This is a complete paradigm shift, and it's very interesting. We still, have, when we build, have to think about sequence. So um, um, when I get into detailing a project, it is always a challenge. It's always something that um, is as much design as anything else. And some people are really into it. I mean, Neil Denari and I will talk about it because he's a geek that way like I am, and we just, we just enjoy it, you know? I, to me, it's not something to be handed over to a specialist. Let's put it that way. Talking about the details in the project, because there's a lot of attention put into the axonometrics and drawings that are produced post-project yeah. design. Yeah. I'm wondering, what kind of drawings do you do or what kind of representation you use pre-project design? Yeah. It's, um, uh, for me, it's always been about um, expediency. What, whatever technology is coming through that's helpful at that time. And I've, I've been around long enough to I remember when, uh, in the office of Morphosis, when we got our first fax machine, okay? So, and we were all excited, and Tom and I were talking, and he said, oh, this is going to be so great. I'm going to send sketches from Tokyo when I'm traveling. And, uh, and, and, uh, and it's interesting with, with those devices, you know, the history of the fax machine, for instance. You know, the fax machine was invented in the late 1960s. It didn't take off until the mid-1980s because there wasn't a critical mass. Of course, one fax machine can do nothing. So then you need two to talk to each other. <laughs> and then you need people to get it. So, so, so and it had to be, you know, uh, economies of means and, and less expensive, et cetera. But uh, the waves of technology since then, you know, the first computer that we, we used in 1993, uh, the, the office going digital in the 90s to today, where we don't really even talk about it, it's just pervasive. You know, past the, the debates in the academy when a lot of young people at SIRC were coming in uh, or, uh, just after uh, 2000, uh, where there were debates about the use of, of the computer, believe it or not. I mean, we laugh about it now, uh, but there were, there were people saying it was not a useful tool, okay? Uh, those, those debates were hard won. Yeah, we, we laugh about it, right? Uh, 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 and, and we were all there for all of that and all had, had kind of different, different roles in it from my side because uh, and Hernan and I will talk about this. Uh, uh, I was in an office during that change. So we were using it for very specific means, dealing with a, uh, the, the, the aim of manifesting complex built form. And it was extremely helpful. It was also kind of a struggle because there was a learning curve. But, uh, you know, and this was going on in Frank Gehry's office in a robust way with with uh, Digital Project and Gary Technologies, of course, uh, and, and, and everyone really in architecture was dealing with that. Um, so we were kind of doing it on the job, you know? Uh, so what it needed to do. Um, uh, and within my own office, I would say we continue to do that. So however one works, one works. The axonometric that you bring up is more just about background because I was trained to draw that way, I think that way, I sketch that way, um, and it's a useful tool. Uh, the, the, it's it's um, less about a kind of conceptual device, I would say, or a stance on representation, as it's just an outcome, maybe, of, our, of, our, of the way we were taught. Um, uh, within, the, within the office, and just in terms of software and visualization, it's whatever we can use, and right now, um, you know, it's finally at the point where my clients are looking at, at our work on iPads and spinning their work around digitally, and we're file sharing that way. And it's, uh, it's interesting, it changes the process a little bit because you can't hide in your awkward growing stages, let's say. So in the beginning of a project where things are really rough, 
it was always explanation like don't it's really rough you know it's not like uh, Pixar yet you know <laughs> and everything's realistic but they can uh, dynamically look at work they can comment on it we can feedback going through so um, 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 but still uh, you know the traditional drawings of plans sections things like this are, are useful to me I would say that your projects have modulated spaces without the use of modules. Would you agree with that? Um, modules. Modulated spaces with um, Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I'm trying to wrap my head on what you would define as a module. A module is in a construction module where there's a module that's repeated. Mm. And whereas the spaces are not created through that method, but they're distributed in a method of separated spaces within a whole yeah. space. Yeah. So I want to talk about the idea that you disagree with the object, mm. and you kind of talk about a more put together object. In yeah. So I want to try and find a way yeah. of describing your point. That's a, yeah, when you phrase it that way, um, we had a, a discussion about the Guggenheim Helsinki and um, uh, there was a moment there uh, where we were asked to define our aims and um, two things. One, I would say within our work there's still an interest and it may be dated now, but uh, of continuity of form. That form, uh, whether that's form and context, uh, sequence, uh, the, the dissolution of multiple separate spaces into continuous ones and formally, this kind of formal plasticity that connects, continuity. That is the opposite of what an object is in many, many people's minds, a literal object like the water on the table, you know, my hand on the table, etc. So there's interesting things going on on, on on the notion of what is an object, of course. Graham Harmon, Tom Wiscombe's very interested in this. This has been going on in the schools, Triple O, etc. I find the discussion super interesting. but. In the Guggenheim competition, I think we stumbled on something, which was, and the way I explained it was, the attempt to create an object that is simultaneously contextual, right? So why is everything that's an object solely an object? Like it has to be a kind of rock on the landscape, right? Is there, are there in-between things that are read as connected that also manifest as object-like? Which to me is more interesting. I think I've seen enough object projects. I know what an object is, <laughs> and uh, 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 whether uh, how that, but how that's defined, I find fascinating. I think um, the recent log piece where Tom, uh, Todd, and uh, David and Graham uh, bat that back and forth was maybe one of the best pieces I've, I've, I've read about it because I think it was quite frank, and I think uh, uh, all of them. Uh, are exploring that, but also uh, admitting where it might not be useful. It, but, but they're trying. That's, uh, they're, I think the discussion is really interesting, and I'm really looking forward to have David here at school. When we look at your project, there is always a sense of slipping in and out. What's your spatial sensibility when designing an open space versus a closed space? Because I think you're your firm deals a lot with designing exterior spaces that aren't mm. enclosed, but yet they're extremely interesting. Right, right. Um, I think, you know, the, uh, well, certainly there's a history in Southern California, I mean, and, uh, you know, inside out and uh, the connection from one, one to the other. Um, I think um, uh, our work is always blurring that. I mean, I think one of the reasons we took over landscape was that we saw landscape as an inside outside thing. So there was really no territory. And I think um, that's pretty general with most architects would say they want to take on everything, right? Kind of total design. So from doorknob to building to lighting to exterior space, to all that all of this is territory for one's work. And so I would agree with that. There is an oscillation as well between smoothened and hard edges. What perception are you trying to control when mm. you're doing that? Yeah, I think that leads back to the continuity, uh, the notion of continuity that uh, that uh, the 
smoothness is useful in manipulating form to create continuous space, um, space that flows, space that that more, let's say, choreographs your movement. So um, I remember as a student, actually Michael Rotundi saying something to me. He said, think about it. You can make a space, and he just kind of did this, you know, like a section. He goes, and you walk in that space and your head moves, you know? That's really powerful, right? You can make people's bodies move just by what we do, right? And I, and I think that notion of uh, choreographing uh, someone's movement through space uh, is something we're really interested in. And so whether that is formally based, it can be done in many different ways. It can be uh, through ephemeral effect, but um, that kind of um, sequential, uh, it's related to movement, it's related to circulation in the buildings, and uh, generally in some of the projects, like the recent houses are doing that in terms of how one enters and, and the daily life of, you know, you're from garage to entry to stairs to bedroom, back again to entertaining, inside, outside, that we're always looking at these as kind of, um, as I said, kind of flows. And, and form then follows that. This is just useful. When you talk about things that are quite meticulous and finesse, so there's a degree of understanding of every move has a consequence. And even with your research on Washman, it's yeah. very detailed. So even yeah. your research work is speculative yeah. in the sense of thinking, but there is no sense of abstraction or losing that detail. Right. Could you maybe talk about that research? Yeah, the, the Boxman research, um, uh, which was put on hold, I, I need to go back to that. But um, what fascinated me about that was the study of a dynamic structure, mainly. I studied two other projects, which were more tectonic and more literal. The General Panel House, which he built a few of, uh, and the U.S. Air Force building, uh, which were, the U.S. Air Force was never built, but prototypes were built. Um, the U.S. Air Force is more related to a kind of space frame. So he was trying to create the ultimate joint that would be the most flexible to create any shape, right? He never really got there. Uh, the study of a dynamic structure is something completely different, and it is completely abstract. The study we did, because everything was hand-drawn, uh, there was never any models built of it, was a kind of uh, complex grapevine structure, it was called. What I was interested in, it was, it was done in 1955, and I found it incredibly contemporary. On a tectonic level, it merged column and beam. Okay, so when we look at that, you, you cannot differentiate between there's something sort of vertical and something sort of horizontal. Uh, and it was purely through geometry, right, that he, that he achieved this. So I was interested in it and kind of, uh, I have to say, when I was educated, we did a lot of analysis. But the analysis was in some ways much more literal than we, we teach now. So you were taught to redraw someone's work by memory. You know, I mean, Werner Seligman, our our first exams in uh, first year were, you know, okay, the, in your first semester, you studied the Villa Savoie and you studied the Villa Rotunda. Draw the plan in section in your notebook with no help from memory. So you had to, to hand draw it. So you were taught how to do that because when you study the building, you understand its proportional systems and one's based on the square and the circle, the other is on the golden triangle. And you can actually do it and it's not that hard but the way you learn in the building, you kind of eat it in a way. You own it. When, and that was the point of the exercise. It was like, not to copy, but to really understand the principles. And once you do, you'll never get it out of your head, right? So um, likewise with Boxman, I wanted to build this form. So we spent, well, with students and I, uh, a, a long amount of time to actually see if it worked because it was a developable multiple surface model uh, its strands never touched each other. So it didn't work as a structural system. So it was ridiculous. It was like, well, wait a second. These things don't touch. So the 3D prints, etc., that we did, we had to insert little holders because the mathematics and the actuality of it, it, it didn't work. So it was purely a research project from an architect and engineer who was always delving in the practical. So this gets back to our, the beginning discussion that we had. So 
I was fascinated in this because he was incredibly accomplished. I mean, he, he understood factories. He, he and Gropius worked on uh, uh, producing, mass producing buildings in a, in a very sophisticated way. And then he's at IIT and he's doing this incredibly abstract exercise, which in the end was about elimina elimination of part to whole because they were continuous lines, again, continuity. And he's saying, it's almost as if, and part of my thesis of it, which is still not completely written, was it's as if he had been dealing with pieces of things and parts to hold for so long. He said, let's just throw that out. Can I actually eliminate the problem? And he only did it for a couple of months and of course made a famous perspective drawing which has been reproduced in this pretty well-known drawing. Um, uh, and proof to the power of architectural drawing that that can be more powerful than a built piece of architecture, absolutely. So. Um, that was the gist of that research, and um, um, maybe I, I saw something in it that was parallel to our work. Talking about influences, I remember hearing you say that um, after visiting one of Corbett's villas, you were really interested in the approach to the villa, the way the villa revealed yep. itself as you approached the building. What other influences have you had that have affected you to a certain extent in your practice and your research? Yeah, um, well, there's people that are influences that I mentioned before. Um, uh, certainly, um, uh, uh, context is one, and that's one that you're, that, that you're talking about. Attention to detail and uh, the interest in that as a, from a content sense. I think, um, um, and in my partnership with Margaret, this has been also she has brought the notion of scape and landscape into the forefront, which uh, and and material, I would say, I'd say I, I'm I'm comfortable in a almost anti-material, and she brings a kind of richness. She brings color. She brings um, something of the hand to us, which I think is helpful. Let's end on the note of how do you view the future of the built architecture in relation to the discourse? Yeah. Um, it's at its core uh, the work we see that's manifest in the world um, started somewhere else right? uh, in, in the sense that the best work, the work that surprises us let's say the work that um, when we see a project and we say, oh, wow, what's that? You know, wait, wait a second, what happened? Uh, because architecture takes so long to do, first of all, we're seeing something that was really conceived years before. So it's already, right? It is not an immediate art form. It is a slow moving one. So what we see in the built, from the academy, generally what we see in the built form is what we did yesterday. Right? Because here it's much more rapid. You have one semester to do your thesis and boom, there it is. It's going to look like it was built, right? Uh, but if you built that project, it would take seven years, right? So its debut to the world would be seven years from now. Think how many thesis projects will be designed in those seven years, right? So the cycles are much more rapid without getting into the kind of cycles of media and image that we're in now, which is so rapid. We can see everything. We can see everything in blogs. Every school is online. Everything's exposed. It's all transparent. We can see it. We can see everything that's built in the built world really immediately. So we're, we're inundated with this information. So the cycle, that cycle's even faster, while architecture still takes as long to build as it always did. So therefore, the gap is even longer. Like you have these many, many, many cycles over there. So. I think that every once in a while, a building is built that can shift it a little bit. That's a kind of surprise. Um, and that's always up to each, each individual person. But it's getting harder and harder to do that. I mean, the last great one would be Bilbao, in my mind, uh, which, which was just, uh, uh, just shifted for many architects a lot of things. Um, in recent time, it would be probably hard to hard to mention one. I don't know, maybe one of Rem's buildings. I'm not sure, but uh, what's what's for sure happening is that the the the, the length of time <laughs> from, from let's say architectural um, 
reinvention, uh, there's way more cycles being made in that, in that length of time. And so, you know, to be an architect is to be super patient always in that world. You have to be, you know, you have to be. I'd like to end with a quote from John's lecture. Keep moving, keep jumping, and most importantly, don't look down. John, it was an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Sid.